Everyone, welcome and good evening. Um, and thank you for joining us for this very special author event this evening, Harlan Coben in conversation with John Grisham. I am so excited to hear these two authors and I know all of you are as well. Um, before I officially introduce them and turn over the virtual stage, so to speak, to our distinguished guests, just a few thank yous and some housekeeping notes. Uh, just a huge thank you to Barrett Bookstore, our partner and uh, co-conspirator in tonight's event. Barrett's is, of course, our local independent bookstore located right down the post road. Um, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Harlan's new book and in April, John's new book, please be sure to visit the very fine folks at Barrett Bookstore or online at barrettbookstore.com. And finally, a deep note of gratitude to all of our friends of Darien Library, whose generosity supports all of the programming and events that we do, including supporting our Zoom platforming, which has been critical during this extended COVID period. And now it is my distinct pleasure to officially welcome and introduce our authors for the evening. Harlan Coben is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 31 novels, including The Boy from the Woods, Run Away, Fool Me Once, Tell No One, and Now drum roll please, win. Harlan is the creator and executive producer of several Netflix television dramas, including The Stranger, Safe, The Five, and The Woods. He was also showrunner and executive producer for two French TV miniseries, Une Chance de Trap, No Second Chance, and Juste Un Regard, Just One Look. Harlan has received an eclectic variety of honors from all over the world. In Paris, he was awarded the prestigious Vermel Medal of Honor for contributions to culture and society by the mayor of Paris. He has won the El Premio del Novella Negra, the RBA in Spain, the Grand Prix de Lectrice in France, and the CWA ITV3 bestseller Dagger, I just love that, uh, for favorite crime novelists in England. He's also been inducted to the Little League Baseball Hall of Fame or Hall of Excellence in 2013 and is a member of New England's Basketball Hall of Fame where he um, for his contributions and playing days at Amherst College. Harlan was born in Newark, New Jersey, and he still lives in New Jersey with his wife, Ann Armstrong Coben, MD, a pediatrician, and their four children. John Grisham is, of course, the master of legal thrillers. His novels have captured the attention of millions of readers, from adults to teenagers. Over three decades, he has written nearly a book a year, and a number of those have been adopted into popular movies. From his debut novel, A Time to Kill, to the 2020 release of A Time for Mercy, Grisham's books are simply unputdownable. Grisham was working as a criminal defense attorney in South Haven, Mississippi, when he wrote his, wrote his first novel, A Time to Kill, which was based on an actual court case that dealt with racism in the South. It enjoyed modest success. He then entered politics, serving in the state legislator, legislature on the Democratic ticket. Meanwhile, he began writing his second novel. It was not Grisham's intent to leave law and politics to become a published author, but the runaway success of the firm changed his mind and what a lucky turn of events for all of us. In addition to novels, he has published short stories, nonfiction and young adult books. His newest book, Suli, comes out April 27th. Harlan, John, welcome again and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Kira. Um, Hi, hey, y'all. I'm John Grisham. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm the moderator of this show tonight, which means I get to ask all the questions that Harlan has to answer. So I, the, the, I have the easy job tonight. He's a star this week. He's on a virtual book tour. Uh, these days, Harlan is almost everywhere. Uh, everywhere you look, you see Harlan Coben from his books, his TV shows, and even a little bit of acting that we'll talk about in a little bit. Harlan, good seeing you, sir. Good seeing you, John. How's it going, man? <laughs> it's going fine. It's going fine. That was you, uh, you hit... listening to that bio thing. She did a great job, but that was painful, wasn't it? Sitting here listening. To yeah, that. you know, it, it, when they start mentioning all your prizes, I get kind of envious. I, they, I, I have received no awards in Paris. What's wrong? I, I, I just can't. I, I'm not that good. Uh, but uh, how's the book tour going? It's easy. Um, you know, Dan Fogelberg in the song Same Old Lang Syne said, um, the audience is heavenly, but the traveling is hell. 
So we have still the audience and we don't do the traveling. So maybe this is good. I don't know. You know, I think you'll be around after the pandemic is over uh, because for the simple reason, you can cover so much territory in a matter of, uh, you know, a matter of hours, you can bounce around from coast to coast. You can visit bookstores and each bookstore has our library, like when we're at Darien, uh, you know, several hundred people who sign up and buy tickets and, and are listening to us now and, you know, doing all that travel would be impossible. I stopped touring 20 years ago because I, I got sick of the travel. A book tour may sound, you know, um, like a lot of fun, but it's business travel. And after two or three weeks of it, you it wears you out. But I think the virtual stuff is going to be a real role for the virtual stuff uh, forever. Um, I, I'll do it again next month and do it again this fall. And so anyway, enough of that. Is this book number 32 or 32? It's, well, it's interesting because you know, you how long it took you and I to do our in-person event that we did in Paramus, New Jersey. What was that, maybe two years ago? It took forever. That was in now we can do something yeah. like this much easier. So hopefully we can do both, maybe, if we get lucky. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a mix of both. Uh, we'll still tour some. Uh, I think all of us will. Um, or will be expected to, but the virtual stuff is really, uh, I mean, I've done in the past two months, uh, I don't know how many interviews with foreign publishers, foreign press, you know, just stay sitting right here and you do a one hour interview with somebody in Spain or Italy or London and you, you can cover a lot of territory and the, the interviews are good. You have time for them. They record them. You can go back and <laughs> tell the people like, misquoted you because you guys it's recorded on zoom so um how, how many how many stops are you doing with this with book tour i don't know uh, six or seven maybe um mostly yeah. like this in conversations with which i think people find more interesting because despite the fact that you may think you're just going to ask me questions it's good i think what will really interest people you know i always say if you ask 10 writers how they do something you get 11 different answers so I think to have the contrast and what we do the same will, will be kind of interesting for people. So like it, and also since I get to moderate you next month, when uh, <laughs> I just got this today, when Suli comes out, I get to turn the, the tide. So um, <laughs> you can get revenge on me then if you want. <laughs> it's, it's real. It's a lot of fun to, to hook up with guys like you, authors all over the country. And uh, you're in New Jersey. I'm in Virginia. We're doing it for a library in Darien. You, you can really, uh, Again, cover a lot of ground, and you know, writers as a as a group are, you know, fairly reclusive because we work alone. We don't really, you know, collaborate much, and so you don't form you don't form a lot of close friendships with other writers. And this is uh, this has allowed me to meet a lot of people. I started touring when I met you three years ago with Camino Island for the first time in a long time, and I bounced around twenty five different towns. And everywhere I went, I invited another writer from the local area to come, you know, do a podcast in the bookstore. And uh, we had a ball doing that. So that's yeah. going to be. And, you know, I think I think our publishers really appreciate it. And the people who really appreciate it are the bookstores and the fans, the people who are buying the books and allowed me and you to do this. Uh, the fans of our readers uh, really get a kick out of it. So let's talk about. Uh, Let's talk about television first. Okay. Um, you're really, really busy. Last week, my wife and I watched uh, The Stranger. Enjoyed that, based on a novel. Uh, last year, we saw The Five, which was not based on a novel. It was um, something you created. Yeah. So the obvious question that, that I, as a writer, that I think of, if you have a good idea for a story like The Five, What's the benefit to you in doing the TV show first as opposed to the novel first? I don't know if I would do it that way anymore. But when I, I, I came up with the idea for The Five, it had four lead characters. And I always saw it for some reason visually. I, I don't know why. I never felt the desire to write it in a novel. And so I had this idea in my back burner. I thought one day I'd write it as a novel. And... I met someone who I really liked working with and thought was really great to collaborate with. And so I, I told her the idea that I had for this. And 10 minutes later, she had called the network and we were on our way. It was, uh, it really kind of happened that fast. 
So the, the good thing about this net, these Netflix kind of a things or having an idea like that is, you know, in the old days, we want to do a TV show, 22 episodes on CBS, 47 minutes, you have the crime first hour minute, you end it at the end, or we condense it into an hour and a half movie. But now, you know, you can make it six episodes, eight episodes, 10 episodes. And it's more like, I think the experience is more like a novel on the screen for both The Stranger and The Five and, and Safe, the three of the in English that I have on, on Netflix now. Why was, the, why was The Five British and not American? Well, because the person I had spoken to about this was British. And I really loved, her name is Nicola Schindler. Uh, she's done Happy Valley, Last Tango in Halifax, Queer as Folk, It's a Sin is Right Now on, on HBO. Um, she did a lot of shows that I, I really liked. And I, and I kind of loved the, the British crime tradition. At that time, it wasn't Netflix. We actually did it for Sky. And, and again, networks wouldn't accept something that was, I always figured to be between eight and 10 episodes. Um, they wanted something that was either, it just didn't fit. So right away, we decided to do it on Sky. And now it's great with all these streaming services. It doesn't really matter where you make it. Um, people can yeah. find it. And I think it's really kind of great that it can sometimes be from foreign countries or in different languages or subtitles. The best stuff I've watched over the last two or three years or five years even has been foreign. So it's been yeah. great. My wife and I are binging on uh, British crime right now. And there's yeah. just so many good theories that um, it, it's it's... We, we admitted last night we're not reading that much because we're watching too much television because there's so much good television out there. Um, have you been tempted to actually write for television? Your own, I mean, like your own adaptations? Uh, I, I do. I participate a lot. I mean, The Stranger, for example, uh, same group that I did The Five with, same four, as a core four, we call it, the, the creative team, same team I did The Five, Safe, The Stranger with. And now we're filming a show called Stay Close based off one of my novels, the same team. So, and then we hope to do another one after that. We already have it kind of planned out in, in the works. I don't write the actual teleplay, but if it was to be broken down, it would be teleplay by and story by me. I do, working with them, do all the outlining. I'm in every meeting. I talk to them every single day. I watch the rushes every day. I get calls from the actors. I'm not on set because well, this year, especially I'm not on set, but I'm, I, so I don't actually do the teleplay work, but I work very closely with whoever's doing that. So I do the story part of it, I would say more, but and then I rewrite them all with this team also. So it's a very, it's just different. It's a collaborative process. You know, a novel, you and I are writer, director, we do lights, we do sounds, we're key grips. I don't know what a key grip is, but I'm a key grip your key grip, but when we do adaptations, it's kind of, especially the ones that Netflix has really given me a lot of freedom. I feel like I'm captain of a World Cup team and I want every player to score and then go on and get huge contracts with local teams versus being a tennis player or golfer where we stand there alone at the end. It sounds like it's awfully busy and time consuming. How do you have time to write the novels? Uh, I'd be interested in how you break down your hours. Uh, so let's talk about that together. Uh, but I'll say this, you know, as you said, we are, I mean, I think you and I, I would describe us both as socially adept introverts, right? Like we can go out and we can talk to people, but we're introverts. We've we can, spent our lives. We can, we can flip a switch and go do it. Yeah. Right. We, we've spent most of our lives in rooms like this, making stuff up, but every once in a while, it's kind of fun to go out. So, I'll go out and I'll go on set or I'll work hard on the TV series. And then after about three days on set, I'm losing my mind and I can't wait to run back and be locked up in this room and write the book. So oddly enough, they kind of almost power one another. Uh, so I haven't really yet slowed down that much with the book, a little bit, but not that much with the book. How, now, how do you do it? I know you have a a shed out back, or we'll call it a house, a hut, a shed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little writer's cabin. It's a writing uh, cabin. Behind, behind the main house. And that's where I go every morning at seven o'clock and uh, write for uh, four or five hours. You know, I never go past noon, but you know, after, after I write for four hours, 
pretty much nonstop. My brain is just mush. I've got to, you know, go do something physical, go work out or play golf or something. You get out of the house. And, um, you, but I, again, I don't, I've never, I've never been tempted to do a lot of uh, collaboration when it comes to the TV or film. Uh, my, my success in film came 25 years ago. The first wave of movies uh, in the early 90s were, uh, you know, all big movies, all very successful, big cast, big domestic box office, but, you know, they're famous movies. I had nothing to do with them. I, I didn't really want to do anything with them. Uh, I was too busy writing books. And in the past, um, that's all changed now. Uh, Hollywood doesn't make movies like that anymore. They don't make smart adult dramas. They make, you know, they want to make cartoons. Um, that, that happened 20 years ago. I, I have not had a, a book adapted uh, to film or TV in 15 years. Uh, we've had some bad luck. I've, I've had a number of TV deals. I have, uh, you have several now that look promising. Uh, but, you know, it hasn't happened yet. Whereas, you know, your stuff is on fire. I read the New York Times, you have a Netflix deal with 14 pending projects. Well, we'll see if they all get made, but we're making, uh, there'll be, I think there'll be seven on the air uh, by, the, by the time we talk next year. So there'll be, uh, next cow is The Innocent, which comes out April 30th. That's Netflix Spain. That's really terrific. I can't wait for people to see that. You'll have to dub it or subtitle it. You can do either one. I always recommend subtitles, but it's really, really edgy and really, really cool. Then Gone for Good will be out after that. And then the one we just started filming, Stay Close. So those three will be added to the ones that are already on right now. And my experience is the opposite. I had a nightmare every time I tried to make any kind of Hollywood movie in the early days when they, when they <coughs> were making them. Uh, and what's interesting is a mutual friend of ours and, per, and publisher who may even be listening in on this, Carol Barron, who we both love and adore and was a major part of both of our careers. Yes. Um, when Good I point. started to, when I first, when Tell No One first started to get a lot of interest and I started to get a, a roving eye toward um, Hollywood, she sat me down and warned me. She goes, you don't want to do that. She said, talk to John Grisham sometime about some of the experiences when he's tried to get involved versus just getting it, getting it out there. And, um, you know, it, it hurt Faulkner, it hurt Hemingway, it hurt uh, Chandler. If it could hurt those guys, it could certainly crush me like a bug. So I did stay away for many, many years from doing anything out there. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned subtitles. Uh, we have watched so many foreign films that you, you get accustomed to watching the subtitles. I was trying to watch a British crime show last night. I had no idea what they were saying. <laughs> and so we scrambled around and get subtitles. I have to have subtitles now for American shows. I'm just so accustomed to subtitles, but it's, there's just so much, there's so much good stuff. And, and yes, a shout out to Carol Barron, a very dear old, old friend of ours. Uh, listen, many, many years ago, and you and I started about the same time. Your first book was 1990, right? Yep. My yep. first book, A Time to Kill, was 1989, and it was a total flop. It didn't sell. Firm came out 30 years ago, March of 91. So we got off about the same time. So we've had a pretty good 30-year run. And years ago, Stephen King, when I first met Stephen King, he, he came to Oxford, Mississippi. We were living there to do a book festival. And we were riding around, you know, shooting the bull. And he said, look, when it comes to Hollywood, um, th this is before the TV craze. He said, when it comes to Hollywood, there, there are, you know, writers who don't deal with Hollywood. That's a small group. He said, but for the, those of us who do, the rules are very simple. You know, get all your money up front, uh, kiss it goodbye and expect it to be something different and stay out of the way. And if you don't like that, then don't sell. And it was uh, advice that really saved me big time because I, I really stayed away. I enjoyed the movies. I've been lucky. I've had, I've had 10 books adapted to film, and, uh, <clears throat> including one documentary. And I enjoyed watching all of them. I didn't, you know, they, they make changes. They have to make changes. But uh, I, I was lucky in the early days. Have not been so lucky here lately getting stuff made. But we're, we're working hard, trying hard. It was announced last week that uh, Matthew McConaughey wants to do or has agreed to do 
A Time for Mercy, sort of a, a sequel to A Time to Kill okay. for HBO. That's, uh, I have not seen a contract yet. And you know what that means? <laughs> no contract yet. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe that'll, maybe that'll be the first one in a long time. I don't know. Well, that's the other problem with that out there. And we could spend the whole time and we won't bore people by whining about Hollywood, but you also just, you, you can't believe a word anybody says, not that they're being dishonest. I think they're just trying to be hopeful. And every day it's like, you know, who read it today? So-and-so. And so like, and he wants to make it and this one wants to make it. And it's like, right. When it's, when it's done, let us know because otherwise it's a lot of noise. It's a, it's a lot of noise. And I wouldn't have done it a few years ago. I'm not exactly sure why over the last few years, maybe I think it's the new streaming services. I do most of it with Netflix. Um, but I think it's the streaming services have made it more exciting and enticing that I, I kind of want to get I want to get involved. My kids have grown, but we'll see. Maybe I'll back off. <laughs> or I'll back off. It's amazing. Right now it's great. It's it's amazing what TV's done in the last. Uh, I think that the Sopranos really turned it around. Yeah. The last show hit twenty years ago, and you realize you can do more uh, with you know with online, with Netflix or HBO or Hulu, whoever, uh, you have far more uh, leeway in what you can do and, and take more chances. Uh, but the, suddenly the rush is toward television, it has been for a while, but all the talent's there, the money's there, and they're just, um, you know, so many really enjoyable shows, a lot of bad ones, but there's so many good ones that you can, we're all binging, we're all, especially during the pandemic, good grief, we're just all, you know, sitting around the house, we, if we're not reading, we're watching television, and so um, it's going to be interesting to to uh, see what happens post-pandemic, I was going to ask you that, what's going to happen in your world once the, all this is over? I don't know, I mean, I don't know about you, but um, look, it was, this, is, this, this, this sucks, there's no two ways around it, and I'm worried about a lot of people and all, and all of that, but for me personally, and probably for you, um, the pandemic, you know, we, we socially isolate anyway. We are, you know, we, we can still do our work. Uh, we can still sell our books. We can still even book tour. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm ready to get out there. I didn't want to write about it while I was doing it. Some people want to write about it for two reasons. One is I was writing when, when, when this pandemic started. So I, and I make the books really whatever current day, but March or April of last year, I didn't know where we would be March or April of this year. No one did. I didn't even know where we'd be in July. I still don't know where we'll be in July or August. So I don't know how I could write something or you and I could write a novel now that would come out about a year from now, maybe more, and be able to predict what the pandemic is going to be or do. We're t I think we're just too close to it. And plus the other thing is, look, part of our job is to give people an escape. Um, you know, we want to entertain you and we want to allow you to escape. So I don't know, people kind of want to, I think, you know, with The Stranger coming out right in the beginning of the pandemic and I, my last book, Boy from the Woods, I, a lot of people said it was a, it was a way of escaping the pandemic. So I don't know if I'm, are you, are you writing about it yet? Are you ready to write about it yet? No, 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 no. Uh, what, what I may write about in the future is not about the pandemic, but, you know, what I do, Harlan, as a lawyer, I, I just I watch lawsuits and litigation and firms and courts and appeals and lawyers, trial lawyers, you know, things like that. And from a distance, I don't watch them up close, uh, but I'm intrigued by the big time litigation and the lawsuits are already landing. I mean, they, they, they've been filing them for a long time. Lawsuits against nursing homes for people died, no, uh, employees who, who were not protected. Um, I have a friend who's a very successful business guy. He had business interruption insurance and, and, and under coverages, there was the word pandemic. He was covered, okay? And he, he immediately turned in a big claim. His business was shut down. And the insurance company said, sorry, I'm not going to pay it. See you in court. And they just stonewalled everybody. Lawsuits are flying like crazy. And it's going to be a I'll, I'll watch that as it evolves over the next few years to see where you, there may be something good there. I don't know, but that's the kind of stuff I like to follow, but I can never, I'm not a science fiction or a, a you know, a medical fiction guy. I don't think in those terms. Uh, so I, I, I would never try to write about a plague or a pandemic, but can you imagine the books that are coming in the next few months from publishers around the world about plagues and pandemics and viruses and all this 
stuff that's going to be the the hottest uh, genre out there, you know, in the near future. But do you so, want to uh, read it? Yeah. It's like when the pandemic first no. hit. You would look at Netflix no. and the pandemic things were trending. I'm like, why would I want to re watch a movie about a pandemic right now? We're living it. So yeah. I, I certainly have. And I have an interest in that insurance book because you've done that really well in the past with medical insurance and yeah. various times. Yeah, you're, you're no friend of the insurance industry, which is great. <laughs> On their toes. So I oh, I've sold a lot of books. I've sold a lot of books going after the, the big bad Goliaths with yeah. David by my side. That's 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 where I uh, that's that's my bread and butter. And I, I, I still we all love those stories. We're Americans. We love those stories. We, we, we love the, the little know. guy taking on the big guy. And, and I'll you know, I, I, there's no way I can get away from that. A quick question for you. Your daughter got a writing credit for The Stranger. Yeah. You she, talk about that. Well, it's interesting. My the, my partner, as mentioned before, Nicholas Schindler, had read a couple of my daughter uh, had a did the script contest in Cannes, France, and won something. Anyway, so she said we need younger a couple of younger people on the staff, and she really liked what Charlotte had written. I was you know I'm too close to her to do that, so we brought Charlotte on to help us with the stranger in two areas. One, she wrote an entire one of the episodes. But the other thing was, and the, this is something that, that's interesting with TV versus a book, I had no teenage strand in the book. The, the book, The Stranger, there's two teenage boys, but they have nothing really to do with the story. And when you're able to expand to eight episodes, and I know Netflix and I love a teenage strand, so we came up with a whole story involving teenagers. For those who have seen it, I call it the alpaca thread. That was mostly my daughter which is why it's wacky and funny. And she, her episode, she's very good at writing humor. So now she's sort of on the team for Stay Close. I think she's probably writing two of the episodes and really involved in all, but we need, you need, this is, you know, people make fun of diversity or whatever, but you need different people when you're doing a TV show to see various um, viewpoints. And we really, especially, I'm, you know, whenever I would write, or someone else, I shouldn't say I, we write the teenagers, they didn't really sound much like teenagers. So she really helped with the younger, the younger audience and, and the comedy. That's her, that's her forte. Enough bragging about my daughter. <laughs> she's, she's really good. How, how, old, how old is Charlotte? She's 20, she's 26 right now. Almost 26. Uh, I've been saying for some time, I've said this in interviews, if you look at the top 10 best-selling writers in America, you and I are lucky enough to be there. Uh, but if you if you look at Stephen King and Dean Koontz and James Patterson, all the guys, Baldacci. Baldacci is the young guy. He's about 55. But they're, they're all a bunch of old white guys. And we need we need a 30-year-old female suspense writer who can publish a great book every year. We need the, the, the diversity. It doesn't matter what, you know, what race or ethnic. We just, you know, we, right. we need good fiction. Good proper there, fiction I mean, because out there. I mean, just to, so people are looking, look, read Attica Locke. I just was talking about S.A. Cosby's book recently. There's a couple. There's two I've read recently that I really am recommending. There's a, they're coming. I'm hope you know they are coming. And right, it's, it's our job to send the elevator back down. You know, um, yep. that's, that, that's part of what I, I you know, our, our job is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk about when. Um, it's a pretty slimy character you got here. I mean, we we love we love to we, we, as 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 writers of popular fiction, where you're supposed to create heroes that readers can admire, okay, and pull for sympathetic people. Uh, Win is not that sympathetic. No, but if you, I, somebody was saying because wow, he's really kind of dark and and but I'm like, look, if you want the nice guy, I've done that thirty something times. You got plenty <laughs> of books where my hero is really a, a, a nice guy you know it's it's adam and the stranger the one you just saw it's the i'm very i've been very big on the father and the family and then myron bolotar and all of that um so i said let, you know win is an anti-hero there's no question about it he's a bit sociopathic um he's rich and obnoxious and charming and yet he still is despite how awful he is he is my most beloved character there's no question about it and this book is, seems to be hitting on a different level than the other ones. So people, I think also, the thing is, John, it's not, as you know, it's not just that we want people to like them and cheer for them, which often we do, but really what's key is, are, are they interesting? If you're sitting in a bar 
And when is it the next to you? That's the conversation you want to listen in on, right? I hope. Yep. 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 Listen, I, I love the guy. I love the guy. I, I love, I've created some heroes before who were, well, one guy, one book is called The Rogue Lawyer. And it was, uh, it was about a guy who was, you know, not that ethical. And right. he's one of my favorite characters. You know, you, you don't, you don't, you want people who are flawed and funny and, and, and not funny and not, I'm not sure psychopathic like when, but, uh, <laughs> but and we met this guy before we met him with Myron Baltar yeah. 25 years ago, right? Yeah. He's, he's Myron's him. best friend from 25 years ago. Yeah. And he, uh, give it, give us a setup with the, with the, the, uh, the first couple chapters with the, the mystery, the dead body, the, you know, give, give the reader something to go on with. How does, how does when get started? Well, and I'm interested in how you start. I actually, write down a bunch of different things I want I want to write about. And then one or two usually will be the book. So I've always wanted to write about an art heist like the Gardner Museum in Boston. I always wanted to write about 60s radicals like Abby Hoffman, what if they are, some of them were still hiding today. I always wanted to write a big kidnapping about an heiress, um, like a Patricia Hearst kind of a thing. And all three of them ended up being in this book because of Wynn's great wealth and where he is. So it opens up with, I also always wanted to write about a hoarder who's discovered in some expensive, huge apartment and no one knows who he really is. And that's how the book opens. A, a hoarder is murdered in this super expensive penthouse uh, on Central Park uh, West. And when they go through stuff, they find a stolen Vermeer that was stolen from Wynn's family years ago and clues that this guy was involved in a terrible kidnapping many years ago. So Wynn has to dive down into, into his own family, into their secrets um, to get the answer. When I started the book, I don't know if you ever had this either, John. I'm curious. What, like I wanted this book because it was Wynn to be much more character driven. I thought I'll have less twists and turns than usual and I'll do more with plot. And of course, at the end, this probably is as plot heavy as any book yeah. I've ever done. Do you, I mean, do you have the same thing where it never goes quite as you plan? Sure, you can't plan everything. I I, I, I outline extensively uh, before I start, and and you know one of my rules for myself is uh, never write the first scene until you know the last scene. Uh, I did a I did a a, a non virtual a, a in person event with John Irving three or four years ago in uh, Toronto, and I asked him a question. He had been quoted as saying he does not write the first sentence until he writes the last sentence. I'm not quite that smart. I can't get the last <laughs> sentence, but I know the last scene before I write the first scene. So to, to do that, you've got to think through the whole book. And so I, I, I plot along with the outline for a long time before I start writing. Some of the outlines don't work. Some, I, you know, I throw away. So but by the time I, if you always know where you're going, it's hard to get lost. And, and writers are notorious for having a brilliant idea and plunging into the book and writing like crazy for a year and get 60,000 words in and suddenly realize that they can't get out of it. There's no ending, there's no plausible ending and they get frustrated and quit. Well, that's a year they just wasted. I'm, I'm too lazy to waste that much time. So I, yeah, I, I, I really outline. I've also learned though, you can't predict everything. You don't want to right. because it's the twists and turns, the new character that, that pops up from nowhere that can really take over a book. When that happens, it's uh, it can be delightful at times to have to have twists and turns or a plot twist, and you're the master of it because you know some of your plots drive me nuts. Okay, because I, I keep thinking, where does, he, where does he find this stuff? What's going to happen? This is too wacky. Okay, like the alpaca. I kept thinking, where's this alpaca story going in, in this page? Uh, but anyway, that, you know that's part of that's part of the process. But it's, it, it, it still it's, it always takes a certain amount of uh, self-control and discipline to stay on point with, with your main plot. And that's not always easy to do. A lot of writers can't do that. So, I, I mean, I would say the same thing, but a little, a little differently. I too, and, I'm not, and we know we've spoken to a lot of writers who have no idea what the ending is when I start. I need to know right. the ending. I need to know, you know, that painting is stolen, when finds that body's found, and I know who did it and why and all that. I don't know exactly because usually I have three or four revelations. I'm not sure which one they'll be in what order, but I know the ending before I start. I compare it to driving from my home here in New Jersey out to LA. I may go Route 80, which is the regular route, 
I'll probably stop at the Suez Canal and go through Tokyo or whatever else. But as long as I can see LA, as long as I know where I'm ending, I'm okay. You can actually go a little crazier because you can still keep your eye on that final prize. I don't know if I, I don't outline like you do. I know a few key spots I'll stop at along the way. And then I also follow, I don't know, Yale Doctorow had a great quote on writing where he said that writing is like driving at night in the fog with just your headlights on. You can only see a little bit ahead of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. The only thing I would add is I know where that journey is going, going to end. So my guess is my outlines are far less extensive than yours, but I'm not sure it's all that different what we're saying. Yeah. Let's talk about another career you may have. I'm not sure you do. In the second episode of The Stranger, did you make a cameo as an actor? Yeah, that was me. I, I played tech guy. Yeah, you didn't I, say a word. You didn't say a word. I know, but I was on for like seven seconds, and I didn't get a BAFTA Best Supporting Actor nod or any anything. I, I, mean, I, 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 I yell. I said, really? that's Harlan on the screen there. He thinks he's Stephen King. He's doing cameos <laughs> in his own movies. And I said, he has no dialogue. I mean, Harley, if, if you're going to write the story, if you're going to create the story, if I am, I'm going to be with the hot chicks and the sex scenes, okay? <laughs> you, you, you didn't say a word. No, Why'd you do my, that? My English accent isn't very good. So they, <laughs> literally, I was standing there that day, and it was really funny because so they had me sit in the seat, or whatever, and they actually had like, they make it, they try to make it very realistic, right? So they had like an ID that was on my belt while I'm sitting. So you can't sit there to me, put that ID on. They're like, wait a minute, that's not a picture of you. I'm like, don't worry. No one is gonna be able to see this ID. I'm sitting at a desk. It's in my pocket, but they that's how like crazy they sometimes get on set with that kind of trying to be um, realistic. Yeah, so I've done it. I've done it, I think for two or three of the shows where I've had one, I actually did have a part with a speaking part on one of the French shows. Uh, they come to America at the end, No Second Chance, and Dana Delaney, the great actress from China Beach and Desperate Housewives, and I play a, ma a married American couple. So there I got a line or two, um, but you don't want to you, know, you, you hire me, I don't think, no. No, I, I hired myself uh, 20 years ago against the advice of everybody I know with good sense. I decided to finance my own movie. And so we made a little league baseball movie. It cost, us, it cost way too much money. And we filmed it here in Charlottesville in my little league baseball park. And it, we had a real director, a real producer, a real, you know, they, they were expensive. Harry Connick Jr. played the, the, the little league coach, the father. And so, you know, it was gonna be a real movie. And we, I was going over the budget. And there's one scene where they hold a little league draft uh, something I do every year and have been doing for 25 years. And they were going to pay an actor $10,000 to do this one day of shooting for this little league draft. And the money's coming out of my pocket. And I said, wait a minute, well, I'm not going to spend 10,000 bucks to pay somebody to do something I do every year. So I got myself in the scene. Okay. And I handled a little league draft again, like, you no no Oscar nominations. It was really kind of dreadful <laughs> stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's not any fun. It, it, you think it's glamorous, but after about the fourth or fifth word. take, you're just ready to scream and say, I can't, I can't do this. But it was a terrible movie. And I, do admire, I mean, you know, people have no idea how many times they do it at different angles and all of that, but how the actors can work themselves up. Um, I've been watching rushes today. Rushes are what they do. They film daily. So every day I get the rushes and they may be an hour, hour and a half, two hours long. And it might, it's probably like th maybe three or four minutes of actual TV. So the, they, you know, when you do an average scene, right, you take the distance shot, the table shot, each person, you know, it's just, it's crazy. And, and how often they're able to do that. Yeah, it's cool. It's like, you know, the other thing is Stephen cool. King said this too. It's cool. I mean, movie making and TV stuff, it's cool. I mean, it's just a fun thing to do also. Gotta have fun at this. They call them rushes? I've never heard that before. Yeah, dailies or rushes, they're called. So some people call them dailies. They, all, they always call maybe them. British, yeah. Maybe it's a British term. The British call them rushes. Okay, I've, I've seen the dailies. When we were filming my movie, they would send me the dailies uh, at the end of each day of shooting, and I knew we were in trouble from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at the dailies. Yeah, but, but it is, um, it is, that's the other thing that's a huge difference is editing and 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 this is stuff we don't really think about. Music 
and all of that sort of stuff. So we're, we're working on right now the edits for Gone for Good. And I, we really had some issues. The first episode just had too much in it and we chopped out so much, almost like you and I do in a book, right? We go through it and we pull stuff out and it's painful. Because in that case, like if we pull it out of a book, right? So I, I, I don't know if you do this. Every, every book I have, a, uh, I'll be curious how you do this. I, have a, I, I make a file called spare. And if I'm not sure about cutting something out, I'll cut it out. I'll put it in the spare file so I won't lose it. And then I go on. And in 30 books, each book, each book maybe the maybe spare ends up being 50 pages long. I've never once, not once, not once have I put anything back, which means you can always cut more. Do you have anything like that when you're doing it? Do you have any kind of, or do you just add it as you go along kind of the thing? What I do each, each morning when I start, I go back and, and read what I wrote the day before. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's editing. It's also... Um, Looking, we all use too many words. We all use too many pages because nobody nobody can tell us not to. So we, we use too many words. Right. I'm always looking for words to cut out, uh, making things uh, leaner and faster and whatever. But it also gets you back in the rhythm of the story so you can go ahead and write for that day. So I, I read, I do a lot of editing then. Occasionally I will, like you, I don't, I don't really call, call it a, a, a file name, but I'll print something to save it. Uh, thinking I'll go back and stick it in later. And like you, I never do. I never, there's a reason you take it out. Right. And the reason uh, Thomas McGuane one time was doing a reading, he said, look, when you're writing, if a sentence doesn't sound right, um, it's not right, get rid of it and start over. Don't try to fix it. You know, you, you, can, you can tinker and edit, you know, a page or a paragraph or a sentence for a long time and waste that time. If it doesn't sound right, I even read every sentence out loud to, you know, for the rhythm and all, just, just trying to get it to sound right. And sometimes I'll sacrifice, you know, bad grammar to make something sound better. Uh, but that's just part of the, I guess, the craft of it. But it's, it was is, it is a constant, constant daily system of editing and reviewing and looking for. And in, by, so by the time I'm through with the first draft, it's in pretty good shape. Uh, I don't have to go back and cut a lot of stuff out. That's exact. I mean, I do, the same thing. I do the exact same thing. So each, instead of writing like this, I like, like you're saying like this, each day I go back and I reread what I did the next day to get a running start. I'd say every 75 pages or so I go back right to the beginning just to see how it's all going. So by the time we get to the end, I've rewritten chapter one already seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times. And I think part of being a writer, like you were just kind of saying, is you have to be an editor. You have to be tough on yourself. I think it was Faulkner or Hemingway. They both get credit for saying you have to kill all your darlings. And it's actually, I found the same thing on TV. So I just got this, this first cut of, this, of the first episode of, uh, of Gone for Good. And there was a part where these two brothers are singing a song to each other about the relationship. I love this scene. It was a beautiful scene. And I realized it had to go. It, re it was painful. We spent the money to film it. I loved it personally, but it was slowing down the story too much and it didn't give enough information. So it had to go. And that's, that's part of writing. Don't you think we have to figure that stuff out too? Sure. 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 So this is book number 32 for you. I think it's 33, but I'm not sure. 33. I lose track. So I did book and stuff like that. I think it's 33. It might be 32. So both of us are doing about a book, uh, at least a book a year, book uh, maybe two books a year. How many are you going to stay on that track? I think I'm a, I'm I'm a, a year. How, what number is what number is Suli for you? I think forty five. I think forty five. I've done some smaller sports books. Uh, that's my first basketball novel. I've done some uh, seven or eight of the kids books. So they're smaller books. I do those in the fall when I'm bored. Uh, but I'll uh, I'll. Um, you know, I, I, I love sports. I love to play around with sports. Uh, different types of books. That I experiment some in the fall. Uh, are you going to, do you see yourself as you approach, as you head towards 60? Uh, I'm, I'm 66, okay, so I can say that uh, to a young I'm man. I'm 59, do you so see, I don't have long to go. <laughs> I'm 59. Do you, uh, you see a book a year for the near future? You know, as I quote, Myron Bolotar always quotes a Yiddish expression in every book I write, man plans, God laughs. But my plan is to continue to write a book every year. 
and you know add tv for as long as i feel like doing that but the book is the is the main thing and um i don't think i want to write i've I had a couple of years where i wrote more than one especially when i was doing the young adult series i did a young adult series i don't think i'll ever go back to that but and maybe you know if it's not working i'll skip a year it's not going to kill anybody if we skip a year but i think for me i don't know about you let me ask you this because i'm curious because i you could also help me here a little bit I, if I don't write, I'm out of balance a little bit. It's not a question of how I have to have a book out every year. But if I let myself, I, if I give myself two years to write a book or three years to write a book or one year, it's the same book. It just took me three years to write. So one, I'm curious if that's also, well, I'm curious if that's also true for you. And also because life's about balance, right? You have, you're, you're, you're balanced with your partner, your family, your what you eat, your exercise, your friends, all that balance. If I'm not writing well, if I'm not writing at all, the rest of it, it's harder for me to get the rest of my life in balance. Comment. <laughs> Go ahead, John. You know, Harlan, I've never been there. I've never been at a point in my life when I wasn't, in the last 35 years, when I wasn't writing. Uh, I've never taken off, uh, I, I've never taken off two months. Uh, because not that I'm a workaholic, I, I, I laugh and tell people I haven't worked 40 hours a week in the last 30 years. And I'm serious about that. I write for four or five hours in the morning. But to me, uh, I still love that seven o'clock uh, visit to my office with a strong cup of coffee and turn the lights on. It's dark. It's quiet. It's no music, no phone, no fax, no internet, nothing. It's me in a little room and I just get to create and work on my story for that day. I did it this morning. I'll do it at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. I still treasure those, those hours. And yeah. if, I did, if I didn't write, I have nothing else to do to fill that time. I don't know what I would do. I'd probably drive my wife crazy uh, if I wasn't writing. And now that the kids are gone, uh, I have even more time to write. Uh, so I'm probably writing too much <laughs> because of COVID. I wrote more words last year than any year in the last 35 years. I'm not sure that's a good thing. Two thick books. Uh, I won't do it this year. I, I won't write as much, but uh, I, you know, after 30 something years, I, I have yet to find a time when I said, okay, I told Renee one time, I said, okay, look, if you want to take off, she fusses because I work so much. And I said, okay, if you want to take off somewhere, uh, you pick the time and the place and tell me how much I mean, you, you want to be gone for a month, or whatever. I don't, we'll do it. Um, and she, you know, we talk about it. it never happens. Now we have two grandkids and we're not getting away from those guys for more than three or four days. So, so we're, we're even locked down even more and, and life is good. We're very lucky to be able to, to do that. So uh, we, we, you know, we, you and I are very lucky to be able to do what we do and, and we, you know, we don't take it for granted. We don't, we don't take it for granted. And it's very true. It's when you get asked, like, what's the downside of being a best selling author? The answer is nothing. It's really, nothing. it's, it's really yeah. the luckiest. And on that note, I see Kira's popped up. So I guess we're going to be getting There's questions Kira. from the audience. We, um, we've gone out with this talk all day. It's good. I'm glad you popped in. I could listen. And I know I've seen some comments from the audience. We could listen to you guys talk for hours. It's been uh, a real treat and a pleasure. So thank you. Uh, we have so many great questions, a lot of wonderful comments and love in the chat and the Q&A. Um, but I will try to answer as many as we can. So let's see. This is coming all the way from Leticia in Brazil. She wants to know, what is your favorite film or TV show adaptation that has been based on one of your books do you have a favorite john you want to take that first i've had no tv adaptations uh, i had the netflix documentary which was six parts um i'm sorry there was there was a there was an adaptation of the firm uh after the movie came out that didn't work too well so i'll stick with movies um francis ford coppola directed uh the adaptation of the rainmaker and it was uh, a very young Matt Damon, uh, Danny DeVito, John Boyd, Claire Danes, great cast. And, and he stuck to the book. He was determined to stick to the book. And it was a great adaptation. That one always comes to mind. That was a, that, that's, I would answer that for John as well. <laughs> I'll, answer, I'll answer John's uh, <laughs> question. I've only had one movie made, but it was really a great one called Tell No One, a French film um, directed by Guillaume Canet. 
So uh, I, I'm, I, I really like that one. And my answer is always, it's always sounds so self-serving, but it's always the cl most the closest one. So even though it won't be out till April 30th, I'll say The Innocent um, the, for TV, uh, just because, and also as John pointed out, a couple of mine are not, are not adaptations. So The Five, which is one of my, one of, that's the, probably the closest to my heart in many ways, was an adaptation, it was an original idea. But good question, thank you. Uh, let's see, this next question um, comes from Robin in London. Uh, what's your favorite place to write about or, or perhaps a, a place to set a story in? Go on. I, I, I place almost all of mine in New Jersey. Um, I don't do, my adaptations are never in New Jersey, which is a fun, interesting <laughs> hybrid that I could go into for hours, why I, I actually like that. I don't like when people try to keep too slavishly devoted to the text in many cases, especially if you're only, if you're making a, a longer series and you can have the talent that, that I have over, over there. So that's, I guess that's my answer. John? Uh, for, for me, it would be Ford County, Mississippi, which is the fictional county I established in the time to kill and set, set it up in, in such a way I could go back there and tell a lot of stories. My last book, A Time for Mercy, was takes place there. Uh, there have been two or three others that take, take place in Ford County. That's where I'm, I'm from. That's the area I know, the people, the culture, the history, religion, politics, food, you know, that's music. That's what I know best. And, and when I'm writing out of Ford County, I, I feel like I'm at the top of my game and as a writer and as a storyteller. I would just add, I mean, because I know this is true for John, I think too, is I think the more specific you are, the more universal the appeal. The more you try to write every town USA, the, the flatter the book will feel. The more you think, oh, you know, I have fans in Iowa, I got to do something that's going to appeal more to them. I have fans in, in Bulgaria, I have to do something. You're dead. I mean, Jersey, where I come from, we have where the S's, Springsteen, Sinatra, and the Sopranos. <laughs> the more specifically those guys are in New Jersey, the more I think it has a universal appeal. And the same with what John does down in uh, down Mississippi. Can I say something about New Jersey? Uh, my first trip to New York uh, back in 1988, <laughs> I was talking to some people, and and somebody made some crack about New Jersey, and I thought. And I thought, well, I'm from Mississippi, okay? I, we grow up with, you know, being the butt of all jokes. And so I'm very sensitive when people talk about where somebody's from. And I simply said, I, I wasn't going to argue. I said, isn't Springsteen from New Jersey? And that was the end of the conversation. It shuts them up every time. There we go. Where's Springsteen? The boss. <laughs> boss saying right. this again. <laughs> That is right. Um, this question comes from Rebecca, who is herself an author, and she talks about when she's writing, she writes so much more than she actually needs, and it's it's this process that you you both talked about about editing and cutting down. Um, but she has an interesting question: Is there anything that you've cut from a novel, or I would add, perhaps was edited out that you regret now that you you think about and you're like, oh, should have left that in, or I wish the editor hadn't hadn't taken that out. Uh, in my case, no. Uh, also, in my case, uh, the editor, I don't think I, I've ever worked with an editor who would cut out something I would insist on keeping in. The editors don't have that kind of power. I, I'm sure John will no. probably answer the same thing. If in the end of the day, my editor would want something out and I'd want it in, I would win that argument. Even, you know, before I was a bestseller, I think I would, I would have won that, that argument. John? Yeah. Uh, no, there's been nothing cut that I regretted. My only regret is I, um, I published a collection of short stories uh, 12 years ago, and, and it's seven very long short stories, and it's called Ford County Short Stories. That's the title of the book. And I wanted to title the book Ford County Long Stories. I thought it was kind of clever because the stories are long, and they talked me out of it. And I've always, they didn't force me to do it, but as Harlan says, they can't force us to do anything. Uh, but I've all, often wished I had stuck to my guns and said, okay, it's gonna be called long stories because they're all long, no regrets. <laughs> Um, let's see, there's a question uh, from Heather in the chat and this is for Harlan. Is there anything that surprised you um, that you found out about Wynn as a character when you fleshed him out for the book? So like things that you didn't realize until you were writing. Yeah, I don't know if it was a surprise, but 
Um, it was interesting to try to explore this character who is, um, yeah, I guess certain facets of him may have surprised me, uh, mostly his self-awareness. I think that's what keeps him being tolerable. Um, if he was, you know, if he didn't quite get that, he if he's not a little bit in on the joke, if he doesn't quite get that world. And I think his his confusion about this sort of inherited wealth, um, he realizes he's got it. He's not going to pretend otherwise. But he also, you know, he gets that it's the, it's, he's winning a lottery. And at the same time, he admires people from that world. So that kind of thing maybe surprised me about it. It's more important what it surprised you about it than what surprised me. But it was actually, I guess the biggest surprise was it was easier to get in this head than I thought. I've always prided myself on saying, I'm like Myron. Wynn is based off my college roommate who had a name equally obnoxious to Windsor Horn Lockwood III. It was ridiculously good looking blonde guy. And before we go to parties when we were in college, he would look in the mirror and go, It must suck to be ugly. Yeah, so, oh, man. But as I wrote it, I realized there's a lot more of me in Wynn than I like to admit. And I think there's a lot more of people in Wynn than they like to admit. Long answer. I have a question about I have a question about Wynn. <laughs> the guy's a, he's a martial arts expert. He's in great shape. He's good looking. He's rich. All this kind of stuff. He meditates an hour a day, but he meditates while watching sex tapes. <laughs> How do you meditate watching sex tapes, Harlan? Um, I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> we'll discuss. <laughs> well, he meditates okay. his own way. People keep their eyes open when they meditate. <laughs> Uh, speaking of names, you mentioned the name of, of the derivation of Wynn's name. Two two people in the audience, Lisa and Teresa, want to know about how you each name your characters. I mean, do you flip through, I guess, back in the day, a telephone book? What do you do? You pick people from your life? How do you name them? Go ahead, John. It, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because every book has 200 names. And after 30 or 40 books, you use a lot of names. You cannot use a name that's too exotic because people can't pronounce it always, but you have to use a name that's unusual enough so people can pronounce it and will remember it. You can't use John Smith or Bob Williams, you know, in a, in a novel. You can, I guess, but you don't. Uh, so you're, you're always struggling for names. Uh, you get them out of phone books. You get them out. I get them out of baseball box scores. I wrote a book one time. Um, and every character was a, like I had the baseball encyclopedia, every character of the, of the first 50 characters played second base in the major leagues before 1920. And so I just, they, everybody's dead, so they can't say anything to you. That's how you just find names. And I'm constantly, constantly patrolling, scribbling, taking down notes for names. It's a, it's a, it's a big challenge. It is. And it's amazing. You know, you find out someone will say, you know, you used the name Pavel, three different books. I'm like, yeah, all right. I don't know. Just sometimes that must have come to mind in whatever way. The other way, you know, sometimes I go through my yearbook. To be honest with you, sometimes I'll go through who's following me on Twitter or Facebook or something like that to look for a name that just kind of strikes my fancy. And that's not just a play to get you to sign up <laughs> Facebook or Twitter. But I do my, my yearbook. A lot of times I name it um, a lot of my old friends' last names or first names will be in the book and and they'll know, you know, it's a little way of doing it. And the last thing I sometimes do is I, I have this charity naming thing where I use the person's name if they donate a certain amount of money to charity. But I, I'm with John. It, it sounds like it's easy. And I don't know if you do this, John, when I'm writing fast, I'll just put like XXY or TK or something like that and yes. worry about the name later. Yes. Yes, yeah. every day. Every day. <laughs> right. We do more than we think alike. This is sort of interesting. Right. Um, Harlan, this is sort of uh, an off topic, but relevant question. Martha really wants to know who's the artist of the painting that's behind you of the clouds, the landscape? Well, it's, that's, uh, De that's Deborah Randell. She's in uh, Kenny Bunkport, Maine. Randall, A R A N R A N D A L L. So if you look her up online, um, she is has a has a gallery in Kenny Bunkport, Maine. Well, there you go, Martha. Right. Um, I know we just have a few minutes, and there's so many great questions. Um, there was a few questions um, about 
your evolution as writers. And, and so somebody asks, you know, what did you learn to do different after writing your first book? And I would extend that to, you know, how have you changed and evolved as a writer, you know, over so many books or have you, I mean, what, what's different about your writing and, and you now as an author? John, you want to grab that one first? A big, a big change happened to me about 15 years ago. Um, my first, you know, half a dozen books were the kind of, you know, glitzy thrillers with, uh, uh, you know, big, big plots and big stories. And in 2006, I published a book called The Innocent Man, which is a true story about wrongful convictions. And that the, researching that book took me into the world of wrongful convictions. And I realized how many innocent people are in prison. And I'm still lose sleep over that. Okay, and I wrote that book, and I put in wrongful convictions and several other novels along the way, uh, and that really made me begin to think about the injustices in our criminal justice system, in our penal system, in our court system, and 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 all the things we do wrong in this country um, to, to criminal defendants, those who are charged with crimes and so on. And it's really had a huge uh, bearing on me as a person and as a writer. You, you, when you write popular fiction, you, you got to keep your politics out of it. You got to keep your religion out of it because you can't assume that your readers share those views. But, but you can also write about real issues that I do maybe every other book, not every book. Uh, and, and, but it's really taken me in a different direction, more as, uh, I guess, socially conscious as a writer. And then, then there are times when my wife, when my wife says, "Stop preaching and just go write a good suspense story." And so I do that. And I, similarly, I think whatever is going on in my life always ends up being in the book, consciously or subconsciously. Whatever I'm concerned with, the book before this, "The Boy from the Woods," dealt a lot with fake news and this whole media manipulation. How easy it is for bots to get us to fight with one another and all that sort of a thing. But for the most part, my process, you know, changes. You know, John was mentioning he writes in the morning. I mostly do my writing in the morning too. When I was younger, it used to be at night. Um, so I also, this is where John and I do differ. John has that one room, and I'm going to try that sometime. But I always am switching up where I'm writing, which is why some I had some more issues maybe writing with COVID. I go to I, I go to a, a coffee shop for a while, then that stops working. I work at a I worked for a while at a stop and shop deli counter. They had a coffee machine right there. I work in libraries. I work in the back of cars. I like airports, whatever. So I, I change up where I'm working. My routine that way is not to have a routine. And that started mostly because I was getting my little kids to school. My wife was a phys is a physician, a pediatrician. And so she had a real job and had to be there. I would get the kids to school and I'm already out of the house. And when I was in the house, I, you you find any excuse not to write. It's like, yeah, I'll write, but first let's paint the house. Let's do anything. So I won't have to get in front of that word processor sometimes, that computer. So being out of the house took that away from me. Well, I know we're a little bit over the hour. Uh, any last thoughts from from either of you before we wrap I, I things up? I just want to thank John. I, 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 this is so nice of you to do, John, and I'll be looking forward to returning the favor. It's just great to talk to you, my friend. So first of all, that's the main thing I want to do is thank, I want to thank uh, John. I also want to thank Kira and everyone at the Darien Library. And most of all, and I'm sure John will agree with this, uh, Barrett Books, you know, these independent bookstores are really suffering right now your community is made better by an independent bookstore if that goes out of business it's going to be a gap or some something like that or a subway sandwich place so that place adds culture it brings people in it just makes every community makes your it makes your house more valuable that you have a great independent bookstore so i ask you to, to please support it john anything you want to add <laughs> or did i get us covered <laughs> Uh, you said it. You said it. Uh, you know, the quality of life in a, in a small town or a big city is determined by uh, the quality of the independent bookstore. That's yeah. where you find the, the uh, creative people, the leaders and, and, and the readers. And so I, I agree 100 percent. Good seeing you. Thanks to the library. And I'll see you next month on the virtual book tour. Harley. Look at John's book coming out. So John, Best I will see you this again April 29th. Follow us to figure out when. All right. 
<laughs> well, thank you both so much. And thank you to everyone. Uh, you are both invited um, to Darien Library and Barrett Bookstore anytime. Uh, if you're in the area, we invite you to come and visit us. Thank you everyone for joining tonight um, and have a lovely evening. Thank you, John. Thank you, Harlan. Take care, John. See you soon. See you guys.